Howdy folks, today we're going to be talking about modeling and what it takes to be a top Viking model right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We've spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and if you enjoy this content, consider lending your support on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us create more exciting episodes for you. Your support really does make a difference. But without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, historical model, the warrior king himself. Give it up for Ru van Mielo. Ru, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, nice that you were with me today in your uh, Camera Shake podcast. I know that normally a lot of uh, photographers and stuff like this that will, uh, yeah, come by. So it's nice to see um, a model and to, to hear the story of a model, I guess. So uh, kind of new, I guess, for you. Or did you do it before? No, that's actually, it's been something, you know, that's been rattling around my brain for a long time. Because, you know, yes, we, we do... Um, have a lot of photographers on the show, but of course the photography industry as such is much wider than that, you know, because obviously, yeah. especially if you're a portrait photographer, well, you need somebody to shoot and very often you end up working with models. So it's, you know, so you're, you're setting the trend, I think that's, that's what it is. You're blazing the trail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do my best. And uh, yeah, again, it's nice that you would have me uh, here. We have some uh, great memories that we made together in uh, Lofoten, of course. So we already know each other. And uh, I think it's nice to be able to tell my story and uh, give you some um, insight on the, the what happened on the other side of the camera, of course. Exactly, because I know that's super interesting. Um, I do get some comments, you know, from listeners um, once in a while. And so today we're going to be discovering, you know, the world of modeling per se, and of course, very specifically the world of historical modeling, because that's that's what you're known for. So just to give um, our listeners a sort of a brief. Um, your overview. We've recently worked together in Lofoten or Lofoten. I'm yeah. still not really quite sure how you actually pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, so there was some people pronounce it Lofoten and then you know I went to a shop yesterday. This is a totally true story. So I went to my little Wait. corner store yesterday to to buy some, I don't know, chocolate or something. And I was oh. wearing my uh my Norway hat. Do you remember the the hat the the uh, hats uh, that we bought? And, uh, and so as I walk into the store, this lady goes in Norwegian. She says to me, oh, are you Norsk? And I'm like, oh, I think that means are you Norwegian? <laughs> so, you know, I, I answer back in my, you know, my my little Swedish. I said to her, uh, no, but I speak a little Swedish if that helps, you know. And then um, she and then she, she responded in perfect German for some reason. You must have picked up on my accent. And uh, so she said, like, oh, you know, she was, she's from Norway, and she just saw me walk in with her, and she wondered whether I was Norwegian, and so we, you know, we started talking. Um, so, and then she, she gave me sort of a lesson on Norwegian pronunciation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really, <laughs> and this literally look. happened in my little shop around the corner. Nuts. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, so that was, that was interesting. But we, anyway, we, um, we worked together um, for, for a whole week, a little over a week um, in Norway, and... Um, and I mean, I have to tell you, you know, obviously I've seen photos of your work before um, and, you know, video clips and stuff, but but really witnessing, you know, what you do in, in person is a whole yeah. different ball game. I mean, it was so, um, it was so real. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually that's, that's kind of the way I approach things because um, if you're, if you're acting, if you're trying to be somebody else in front of the camera, then in my opinion, it shows. I, I'm not trying to act like somebody, I'm trying to become that person who I want to uh, show to the camera. Like, for, for example, we have an idea, like I want a Viking on a mountain with this kind of pose, it has to be angry, it has to, like you did um, tell us on the start of the uh, whole experience what we've been through together, that it's kind of a story that you want to tell. If there's no background information, if there's nothing, then you just have to make it up on the spot. And for me personally, it's it's like it's it's uh, uh, like acting in, in a movie or whatever, for example. And then you know your script, you know what's happening, you know the character you play, and then you just become the character. And most people think like, ah, on a photograph, it doesn't show. It's just a static pose. You just smile, you look angry, you do whatever. 
you take a picture and you got it. That's not entirely true, uh, in my opinion, because I think like if you really try to become that person, if you know the background information, like for example, um, I should portray a warrior who is uh, out for revenge because his woman got killed, whatever. Then I try to envision like the anger, the hate, the combat readiness. And if you think about it, I think your body, your face, your mimic, your expressions go along with the, the things you uh, want to show to the people. And that's a lot, uh, like if you say to me, look angry now, go, mm. but that's different than when I try to feel the emotion. I try. It's like playing in a movie, but with standing still in between. Because I don't know if you've noticed it, but if people do not give me um, additional uh, uh, feedback in how they want me to post, then I'll just listen for the clicks. And as soon as a click, has occurred i'll just change my post just ever so slightly like uh, again for example if i'm coming towards you and i have to do some aggressive moment movement i'll come put up my dagger a little bit like this i'll stab it a little bit further change my expression a little bit more and me a little bit less i look to the light with my eyes whatever and i just try to envision step by step how i would imagine somebody like that coming towards you or whatever and i think that if you approach it that way the photos would turn out a lot more realistic. And I think that also the the even though it's a static image, you take the people with you on a journey through that story. And I want the people, if they look at my photos, that they say, Ah, oh, this is happening. Ah, oh, this is this is what's going on. To tell a story with just a static image. It, that was I tell you what, that was one of the most uh, so fascinating things because uh, we had obviously we had you as a as a male model, then we also had um, Maria mm-hmm. as a as a female Viking basically. And yeah. um, it was super interesting, you know, the uh, the variety and the breadth of, of images that we were able to create, you know, or that that everybody on the on the workshop was able to create, you know, because it, of course, you know, I think the the first thing when you think Viking is you think you know uh, swords, you, you think violence, you know, you think aggression, and yeah, of course, that's sort of part of it. Um, but then also there's you know the the romance factor for example you know when you have a couple you know and um and the the story you mentioned the the storyline approach you know and that's you're right that's something you know i talked about in the um in the master class in the portrait photography master class at the beginning is was really that you know you want to create a storyline around the scene that you're putting together and so this could be you know so you're, you're basically um you're sort of attaching a role to your character so it could be something like you know, you could be the aggressor or you could be the protector. These are completely different, you know, different scenarios. Um, you know, you could it could also be a romantic scene, for example. You know, it's and we we shot all of these things. You know, we shot um, we shot aggressive scenes, and it was it was great. You know, to see you really get into character. Um, you know, I think I think your your screams were like reverberating around from the islands for quite some miles, which is great. Um, but then we also, you know, we also shot really, um, you know, really magical kind of romantic scenes, you know, by a little, by a river, um, you know, remember there was this little river crossing and we managed to, you know, uh, backlight them and, you know, see the other and, and give them like a really kind of like a, almost like a magical, it's like a very, very much a softer look, you know, rather than the sort of, you know, aggressive, stereotypical kind of Viking look. Um, and it really, it really worked really well i want to take you i want to take you back just a little bit we'll, we'll kind of come back to of course to uh to the default experience and because some great news on the show as well by the way if you're uh, well actually regardless if you're listening to the audio version of this or if you're watching on youtube um, a little bit later on the show we've got a great announcement so keep watching um it's there's something fantastic a fantastic news that's coming up um in a little while but anyway i want to take you back um to your sort of modeling the beginnings of your modeling career um, because when, I mean, when I think of a typical model, um, you know, I think of somebody who, I don't know, like, you know, who models of it, it yeah, what's, what's the best way to explain it? Um, I, I think, I think of, you know, somebody who kind of, uh, sort of slips into different roles, um, and does different things, but your speciality is, and I've learned this term from you, actually, you call it historical modeling. Um, mm-hmm. how did you get involved in that and like how did you how did you end up there um well i was invited by a friend of mine to join uh, uh like this uh, historical fair or cosplay event 
uh, with all kind of um, cosplays, also Vikings, also historical, but also just fantasy um, in general. Um, I didn't have a costume. I just had a beard and, and, and some long hair. And everybody said, ah, you look like a Viking. Oh, you, you could play in the series Vikings. Oh, you look so Viking-ish. <laughs> So I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll go as a Viking, just drink something and listen to the music just for fun. But there's a lot of photographers there, amateurs, professionals, everything. And of course, people see you walking there and you get uh, some attention and they ask you, like, ah, could I just snap a quick picture of you? Um, and actually, one of the photographers who I met there uh, sent me a private message asking me, like, I'm, I'm working on this special portfolio uh, um, shoot. And I want to photograph guys with beards, men with beard, beards. So I said, yeah, well, why not? You know, I never did a real photo shoot before, but I thought like, yeah, what do I have to lose? So I went there and I did some shots um, in a suit, just regular, normal shots, not as a historical Viking or, or warrior or whatever. Uh, and I did some shots as a Viking. And the guy said, oh, you're so talented. And, and the, the, the pictures are so good. And even when I did not have any experience to come back to what I just said, I was just trying to envision like, yeah, how would a Viking walk? How would a Viking look? What would he do? How would he behave? And I just did that, what I thought was best. And of course, it wasn't perfect. It was my first shoot ever. But I did like the shots. Um, so basically, I just kind of rolled into it. I never was planning on being a model. I never had any experience whatsoever. I was just always into historical things. And people said that I, my look, matches the historical settings or at least what people think is historically accurate um and that's basically how i rolled into it so you've always had to, um you've had sort of an interest in in the history and in, in especially in that in that, in that part yeah. of history the viking age um well not particularly viking exclusively but it's basically i i love fantasy games. I love movies like Lord of the Rings, a uh, series like Game of Thrones, just everything with fantasy, horses, dragons, knights, barbarians, Vikings, it all just, I don't know, I, I feel some connection with it. Um, so I was always interested in, in, in those kind of uh, things. And to be able to um, portray those in, in photos and videos and, and to give my take on on how uh, somebody in that age or time period or fantasy setting would look like, behave, or, or you know, that just really captivates me. And it's, it's so nice to do. And, of course, nobody knows exactly how people would have looked or at least moved, behaved, or whatever. We have a lot of historical finds about clothing and, 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 and how the horses would be dressed, but nobody was there. So it's always open to some kind of interpretation. And I really like to fill that with my interpretation it's and also you know if you play loads of video games or one of the my favorite all-time games is, is zelda and all the the, the the whole zelda franchise just a, a kid riding his his horse with a sword and and a, and, a, and a shield and now i'm doing that i'm riding a horse with my shield and my sword and i'm doing that for fun but also for the photos and as a job and that's it's so amazing it's actually just talking about the horses real quick. I mean, this this was another uh, incredible sort of added bonus because um, you and Maria, you're actually expert horsemen at horsewomen, I guess. Is that the word? <laughs> at the same time. Um, I guess so. We'll just make one. So, because uh, that came in really handy because uh, there was one day we spent um, at one of the beaches uh, with horses. Um, and to, you know, so we were able to photograph uh, or to create images that had you guys... Uh, riding horses, leading horses, and so forth. So it was it really uh, it, it really gave it an extra sort of layer of authenticity, which was really cool. And I know some of the some of the images that I've seen uh, from that day are just incredible. You know, we had the sunsets, we had horses, we had this white beach, um, almost like Caribbean looking beach, I would say. You know, um, and uh, you know these these beautiful Icelandic horses as well. Um, so that was another added bonus. And of course, you and Maria, you were like in your element because that's kind of what you do over in the Netherlands when you're not modeling. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Maya has a horse farm. She uh, breeds uh, uh, a special kind of uh, German breed, the Black Forest horse uh, or Schwarzwalder Fuchs, how it's called in uh, Germany and Holland. Um, 
Yeah, it's just basically, I mean, I just told you I'm a big fan of Zelda and for the people listening or watching now, um, Zelda writes, uh, or Link, the main character from Zelda, writes Epona, that's his horse, which is a brown horse with white mane. And the Black Forest horses are brown horses with white manes. So it's, Perfect. it's like a <laughs> direct copy. So it's amazing to, to, to ride them. And of course, you know, if you're into historical things, whether it's a knight, a barbarian or whatever, all the cultures in the world, they have at least some connection with horses. If you're talking about Native Americans or the Mongols or whatever, they're all amazing horse riders. And it's just a big part of history as well, because we didn't have cars back in the day. So yeah, horses were used for transport. They were used for agriculture. They were used for warfare and anything in between, you know, so... Uh, to not uh, be able to include horses in histor historical settings is just a big miss for me because they were so important. Um, and it also adds so much to the flavor, I think, because, I mean, how many poses can you do with just you and your sword? I mean, after one hour of shooting, then I can have, you know, all the poses you can uh, imagine, I can do them. And to add a horse or a whatever animal in historical setting is just such a big bonus for me. And of course, yeah, me and Moya, because we live on the farm here, we take care of the horses every day. We're not only good riders, but we also know how to position ourselves, position the horse, and just make the whole image come together, you know? And if you're inexperienced with horses and maybe a little bit afraid, or you don't know exactly where to stand, people are always very careful not to come too close to the rear end, or, you know, they don't want to brush up against the horse because they're scared they may might get hit or whatever and we know what we can do you know so that i think that that's a big bonus um to know um what you can and also cannot do with the horses and yeah i'll just love it when i can use all these extra things uh, it adds to the flavor but also like i just said the, the story creation you imagine yourself riding towards battle or, or to war gives such a um a great feeling and i think that also shows on on the photo you know Absolutely. And it's just, you know, again, like I said, you know, it just it just adds an extra level of authenticity to the whole thing. And, you know, and it gives you just more variety because we were out in these incredible landscapes for, you know, seven days. Um, and I mean, it, it it was it was really incredible. I and mean, wherever you looked, there was there was a great background. Um, what what did that feel like for you? Because I know, you, I mean, you've obviously you've been doing a lot of, um, you know, Viking modeling um, and photo shoots, you know, over in Europe. Um, what does that yeah. feel like to you all of a sudden being in the Lofoten Islands and being in the birthplace um, or, of of Viking culture and in that landscape, which is, I say authentic. I mean, uh, the landscape really hasn't changed in a thousand years at all. What does that feel yeah. like to you? Well, I've got a lot of great stuff in Holland, what I can use. You've got a Viking ship, an Iron Age village, uh, stuff like that, which is really, really, really cool. But we don't got get uh, got mountains. We don't get the big granite rocks. We don't get the the same kind of sea what we have there. You now being on the on the those islands and exactly how you uh, told it like this is the real Viking scenery. The background they were actually there. I mean, of course we have modern houses now, but just the scenery, the mountains they were there uh, twelve hundred years ago. They are there still now, and of course um, it's so easy as a model to try to imagine like how it would be because I feel the cold wind blowing in my face. I feel uh, the, the, the the energy of the mountains. I see the, 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 the wind blowing on the sea, making those foam heads. You know, I, I feel exactly, I think, how a Viking would have felt, you know, standing there. So it's easy to imagine the story. It's easy to um, place yourself there where the Vikings would have been. I'm um, so... Yeah, it was almost like a pilgrimage for me, you know, because I was just, you know, so curious about the, the Scandinavian uh, uh, landscapes and, and the, the people and, and the scenery and all the stuff we could do there. Um, Modeling-wise, it was for me just like a fish in the water. It was so easy. It all came together, you know. I just did my part, which was so awesome to do because, as I said, the scenery just it, it, it makes everything come alive. You don't need to convince yourself you're the Viking standing there. I feel like the Viking standing there, and that was just amazing. Hey, let me just jump in real quick to tell you about the amazing sponsor of this episode, Platypod. Platypod offers innovative camera support systems designed to unleash your creativity. With their stable, versatile, and portable solutions, 
you can capture stunning shots like never before. And I'm not just saying that. As the host of the Camera Shake podcast, I can personally vouch for Platypus' incredible products. They've become an integral part of the show. In fact, I'm surrounded by various Platypus products holding up lights, cameras, microphones, and so on. It's really helped to transform the way I make the show and the way I shoot at home, in the studio, and on location. But don't just take my word for it. Explore Platypod's website at www.platypod.com to discover their range of products, including the Platypod Extreme, Platyball Tripod Heads, and the brand new handle, of course. Make sure to follow Platypod on Instagram and Facebook at Platypod Tripods for exclusive updates, tips, and giveaways. By choosing Platypod, you're not only investing in your photography, but you're also supporting the Camera Shake Photography Podcast. Thanks again to Platypod, our amazing sponsor. Platypod, where innovation never sleeps. For me, from a, from a photographer's point of view, you know, um, whenever you put a shoot together, one of the so one of the most important things that you think about is the background. You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to put the back, background together? And I have to say, um, I didn't have to think about that at all. Like in that place, it, it really, I mean, you know, literally, you turn left, great. You turn right, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that was just absolutely yeah. everywhere. Yeah. For, for me as a model, it's exactly the same because it's not that I'm looking at the background because I don't care what's going on behind me. I'm focusing on what I'm doing. But of course, you feel the surroundings. I see, you know, if you, if you focus on one point, you, you see on the left and the right and the up and the down, you also see what, what's going on, maybe not in detail. But if I'm just focusing on a point and you tell me to look there, I'm just feeling the scenery around me. I'm just encapsulated with, with this old, great Viking atmosphere. And I think that really adds to the photos. And I think that uh, seeing the results, you really see that, you know, that, that, that the whole, it just it just comes together. And what people don't necessarily realize um, when when they look at the at the photos is how I mean we spent hours sometimes six eight hours out um, out shooting and of course it was windy with some Arctic wind coming in you know it was uh, it was getting kind of frosty and you guys in your costume I have to say you know I had major respect um, because you know it was it was getting frosty yeah it was but yeah as I said the first day was the worst because then I really had to acclimatize. Nice to the to the cold weather, but <laughs> after the second day, I just I just let it come. Of course, there were moments where it was cold or windy or whatever, but I thought to myself like, "But this is how it was. It's not like you know the Vikings would just uh, go inside like, ah, it's a bit too chilly to go raid today. You know, <laughs> if they had to, they had to. You know, but, so yeah. I'm just standing there, and I, I'll instead of trying to block the cold and doing my job in the cold, I just let it come, uh, let it engulf me, and just feel it and use that feeling to express myself for the photograph. It really, it really came alive. Um, it, the one thing I hadn't really, really thought about beforehand was, um, you know, the wind. Um, it did get quite windy. I think it was, it was pretty windy most days, you know, not like hurricane strength, but it was pretty good wind going. But what that really did to, you know, your costumes, for example, you know, Maya's dress or your cape, um, it really added a lot of movement into those images, which was which is just fantastic. Again, it just added an extra sort of an extra layer of realism to it. And we didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to have wind machines, you know. <laughs> we didn't have to have people pulling on a dress. Nothing. Yeah, it was just it was it was perfect. Um, did you? And then of course we also saw the the Northern Lights. Was that the first time you've, you see the Northern Lights? That was the very first time. Um... I remember, I think it was the very first night we saw just a small glimpse and I was like, is that a cloud? No, it's moving a little bit too awkward for a cloud. What is it? Yeah, this is supposed to be the Northern Lights. So I was like, ah, okay. Well, not as exciting as I hoped it would be. But that, <laughs> our big friend Dave Williams, he delivered. Because I remember, I don't remember what, which night it was, but it was somewhere uh, midway through the um, a workshop, I guess. And then I just looked up at the sky and there was this big ring and it was moving up and it just moved so fast. We talked about it before. I never thought about it that it would actually move at all. I mean, I've seen thousands of pictures, but it's just a big green cloud and I thought everything would be illuminated and, and stuff like that. But just to see it moving... And dancing the only thing i thought is i can totally understand everything i know about norse mythology 
and other mythologies connected with the Northern Lights because this is something, now I know how it works, I know why it happened, um, you know, they've explained it to us uh, in detail. But if you don't have that knowledge, if you don't have modern science to explain it, then you're just looking at the sky and you're going, what the actual F is going on? And um, I can totally understand there's loads of mythology based on, on these occurrences and these dancing lights in the sky. I mean, if you don't have an explanation that it must be some something higher, you know, and to be there in first person, enjoying that, seeing that, um, it was amazing. And to combine that with photography you know me standing there as a viking model under the northern lights that, that's just bucket list check you know that's <laughs> i love it yeah i love it. yeah it was incredible um i, I was lucky actually because i got there um the, the day earlier so i got there the day before you guys um and we had a really clear night that first night and i remember going out uh, with dave and uh you know and i remember him saying oh can you see the northern lights look up and I'm, i look up and i'm like i'm thinking I don't know. I, I can't see anything. <laughs> he was like, "Oh, can you see the green?" I'm like, "Well, I don't know. Is it green? Is it blue? <laughs> I don't know." Green. Um, and then, just as I was about to get back in the van, um, I look up, and the whole thing just went crazy. It just exploded. You know, um, streaks like really focused streaks, and it's it's like you said, it's this. It, you know, just like you, I, I didn't expect them to move that fast you know it was really yeah. it was it was astonishing and if you think if you think about how high up they are in the atmosphere and yeah. the distances that these things travel i mean it's it's just it's just absolutely mind-blowing uh, in fact i mean you know my mind was blown uh, really to the point where i pretty much forgot everything about photography you know it was it was <laughs> just you know and you know the funny thing was the next morning um i remember i remember standing in the shower and looking up and my neck like my neck muscle just ceased because I spent the whole night before just like this yeah. looking up. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, dang it. <laughs> well, yeah. But yeah, it was uh, it was it was a mind blowing experience. Crazy. Yeah, definitely. For me, it was it was unreal. I mean, even now, I still you know when I'm <laughs> in the evening driving and I see the last bit of clouds, I'm just look. Oh, no, don't. Oh no, I'm in Holland. You know. Can't be the Northern Lights. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it kind of starts, when it starts, it kind of resembles like a long, elongated, uh, cloudish kind of thing. And I, every time I look up at the sky and see something similar, I'm like, ah, oh, no, 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 it can't be. I'm still in hold. But yeah. It, yeah, it's, it, I have the same, the very same experience. Yeah. Yeah. I have the same experience. It's, uh, I, I still, I sort of, I look for the Northern Lights. Just sometimes, like, when it's dark, and I'm, let's say I'm taking the dog out for a walk or something, you know. And I look up and I'm like, I wonder where that... Oh, no, it's not going to happen here, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and I still have the app, actually. Um, it sort of pings up on my watch. And it says, like, um, you know, the Aurora will be visible in 60 minutes. And I'm like, great. Not here, is it? <laughs> not here. <laughs> well, I deleted it a week after because I, I got the same problem. Uh, exactly, you know, this is every time they're sending me, in 20 minutes, the water lights will be visible in Svolvia Lovoten. Uh, yeah, but I'm not there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and if you again, if you're listening to the audio version of this, uh, and you want to, you know, see what these images look like, I'll be flying in some of the images um, in the video version. So if you are listening to the, to the audio version on Apple Podcast or Spotify or somewhere, you know, head over to YouTube and uh, check out the video version of this, where you can see um, a lot of the images that we've shot, um, both, you know, the, the modeling images, but also I'm going to fly in some of the Northern Lights images, just because, just because they were so remarkable. Um, it, it really makes you feel like you're part of a club once you've seen them, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. The, the Northern Light Club. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, <laughs> yeah. the whole experience, you know, it's 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 a bucket list thing, you know. I think that everybody sure. in, the, in the whole world should at least one time see the Northern Lights, period. No discussion possible. You should. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. It, it looks so unreal. I mean, this is the, the thing I think that I couldn't get over really is that it's, it just, it looks like a special effect, you know, it, it's, it looks like a special effect in a movie and it's not, it's right happening. It's, right, it's happening right there. You know, that was the thing um, that really sort of frazzled my mind. And although we'd done an Aurora masterclass beforehand, 
and you know we all understood mm. the the science behind it you know to an extent it, it's still my brain had a hard time computing what was going on <laughs> you know? i think that's because there's nothing like it i mean there's yeah. i mean like i said it kind of resembles a cloud when it starts maybe perhaps a little bit but there's nothing like it it's not like ah this looks like no this doesn't this northern lights look like northern lights and nothing else and because there's it's such a small part of the world where it's even visible there yeah. are not a lot of people who see that on a daily basis or see that at all in their lifetime so it's such a unique uh thing of nature i mean still i know the science behind it and i just believe they put whatever he, he says to me but still it's so strange to see protons ions uh, in the clouds uh, reacting with oxygen yeah whatever man there are dancing lights in the sky what the hell is happening? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I look at the clear sky, I already love it, you know, with stars and moon and yeah. whatever, but can you imagine that there are dancing lights there? Exactly like you, you just told me, it's like special effects in a movie, but it's life True. happening right in front of your eyes. And it really feels like they're alive. That's the thing. Um, you know, and of course, when, when you see them in like photographs, they, you know, they're stationary because it's a photograph. Um, but what you don't really realize... <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, is is how fast they move. I mean, you know, it, that's that's the thing. I think that that really surprised me. And you know, they move, and of course, sometimes they move very slowly, and often they move very fast to the point where you know, w once you you set up your camera and it's, you've got it all ready, it's pointing in one direction. Um, you look up and they're gone, and you go, "Well, hang on a second, they were here one second ago," and then you turn around and they're behind you, and it's just, you know, it's incredible. Um, it, it's funny because um, only a couple of days ago I had a conversation with somebody who had been to the north of Norway and um, right. and said to me like, well, I didn't really see, didn't we see any northern lights? And I think he had, a, he went there with the Navy, that's right. And uh, he said like, yeah, I've been there, I've been there three times, I've never seen any, any northern lights. And it just made me realize how important it is to, you know, to, to work with somebody who is sort of an expert guide in that area yeah. because there were yeah. days when it was crystal clear and everything was going off and it was exploding but there were also days where it was overcast you know and then it wasn't a matter of whether there are northern lights or not because you you know you could kind of see in the data that they were there the the kp index yeah. which was the which is the index that basically tells you how intense the northern lights are going to be on that given night um, you know, you look at the data and you go like, yeah, you know they're going on, but there's a cloud cover and it's happening above the cloud. So, you know, so you can't necessarily see them. Then it became sort of a cat and mouse game of finding a hole in the cloud cover. And that was, I think, one of the things that, that really, you know, fascinated me the most, uh, what stumped me the most really, was the fact that I don't know how many data points Dave had. I mean, he had like tons of different data points. He knew exactly when the weather was doing what and where and at what time to be there and like, you know, and it's uh, that was a that was a thing, you know. And we'd be driving for an hour and a half to get from one side or two hours or something to get from one side of the island chain to the other side. And he knew exactly that there was going to be a hole in the clouds at that time in that particular place. And we'd be there, and we'd be looking up, and it literally there'd be a hole in the in the sky, and the northern lights were there. It was phenomenal. Well, I actually thought that um, before I went there that the northern lights would just happen on certain days, and you just open the door of the cabin, you look outside, and there'd be no other lights. Why not? Why wouldn't it be? But that's not the case. I mean, the northern lights are there most of the time, but the, so are clouds and bad weather and wind and whatever factors yeah. that are, you know, involved in being able to see them or not. And that's the thing about Dave. He knows how to not, not hunt the northern lights, but to hunt the holes in the clouds to be able to see them. And he did an awesome job at that, of course. Uh, but there was really a, 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 I, I didn't realize that, that that was necessary to see them. Because as you just said, I've also met loads of people and and they also send me messages after our journey, of course. Like, yeah, I went there, but I didn't see any northern lights. Even the people we met at the restaurant there, like, oh, we are here for a few days. We haven't seen the northern lights. And we were just, you know, haven't seen them the day before. And I was like, oh, why not? But also yeah. they thought like, yeah, we we'll just look outside and we don't see any northern lights. So where are they? Well, the northern lights yeah. are there, but you can't see them because factor this, this, that. And Dave knows exactly where to be, uh, where to look, how to interpret the data to see where you should be. And that's, he did an amazing job. 
And there was the other thing, of course, there were clouds, but they're also just massive, massive mountains, you know, like a thousand meters tall. Um, and of course, at nighttime, that's just, they're just black. But it also means you can't really see the sky behind them, you know, depending on where you are. Um, and if the northern nights are going to be happening in 20 minutes time or in half an hour time on the other side of that mountain, then you're going to have to get there. And then you're going to have to know the terrain and the area, like the back of your hand, because you need to, you know, you know you've got 30 minutes to get from here to the other side of the mountain. Um, in order to get the full light show. Because otherwise, if you were stood in this place, you'd look up, you wouldn't see anything because your view would be blocked by these, by these mountain ranges. And I was, you know, again, that was, uh, it was just a, it's the most surreal thing. Um, and of course, we were on call all the time. I remember like we were at dinner one time and and uh, Dave went, okay, guys, you got to be ready in 20 minutes because we're leaving because it's happening in an hour and a half and we got to go to this place. <laughs> like, okay, right. Pile in a van, <laughs> off we went. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, as I just said, you need to hunt them or at least hunt the holes in the clouds. And if it's showtime, it's showtime. You're not gonna gonna wait around and see like, ah, maybe they'll happen later. Now you have to take every chance you get to be able to see them. But it's totally worth it, of course. I mean, the, as we talked about it before, the experience is so amazing. Everybody should see it at least once in their life. Absolutely. Now, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna talk to you about the incredible detail in your costumes and in your in your weaponry. And everything, but before we yeah. do that, um, at the beginning of the show, I promised that we had some amazing news, um, and we do because we've got another workshop coming up on the twenty fifth of January, uh, starting the twenty fifth of January, um, lasting until the first of January, first uh, of February. Sorry, twenty fifth of January to the first of February. Um, that's going to be our last workshop in this season. Um, it's going to be the. It's going to take place in the Lofoten Islands, same place. But of course, it's going to be January, so it's going to be wintry. It's going to be cold. It's going to be snowy. We're going to have snowy landscapes. Um, we're going to have incredibly clear skies because the weather uh, is moving in from the north with crystal clear skies because the air is going to be cold. So, um, and it's going to be slap bang in the middle of the um, aurora season or the northern night season. So. Best chances to see some amazing, amazing light shows in the sky, in a landscape that's really, uh, it is probably the the most beautiful landscape in the world, um, in the Lofoten Islands. Anyway, if you want to find out more about that, um, go over to idavewilliams.com. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to put it on the bottom of the screen. If you're listening to the audio version, then you'll find all the links in the description. So make sure you check that out. Um, there's also, there's a, wow, okay. So now this is the big news. So the big news wasn't that we're going to have another workshop. That was always, that was always the case, but here's some big news. First of all, we're going to have, a, <laughs> yeah. so we've got a 5% discount, um, coming up. The discount code again is going to be in the description, but that's not all because we've just heard from our friends over at Adobe that if anybody who signs up to this workshop will get a full year of a free full Adobe Creative Cloud subscription. So that's an amazing deal um, because that's worth quite a lot of money. So if you are interested, uh, this is the chance. It's the last workshop um, this season, 25th of January to the 1st of February. Um, it's a super awesome deal. You can get 5% off. Plus, you can get a full years of free Adobe Creative Cloud subscription to go with it. So a massive, massive, massive thank you to our friends um, over at Adobe. Um, that's, it's an amazing gesture. Um, and that just shows you how much, you know, the guys at Adobe believe in this uh, in this opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime bucket list type of a moment. Um, and it'll be absolutely incredible. Anyway, so, you know, head over to the de uh, to the description, um, you know, and, uh, and check out the links. Um, if you're interested, it'd be, like I said, once in a lifetime type of thing. Okay, now. That's super great news. That being said, uh, let's have a chat about your incredible costumes. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I've seen photos of you um, and, and your work, um, and Mario, and uh, and there seems to be like a whole like a whole group of of uh, biking um, actors, jog models that I seem to be coming across all the time. <laughs> it's incredible. But when I met you in person, I remember you know obviously I picked you up from the airport, but then um, the first time you went into full costume, the full armor. The detail on that is just outrageously incredible. Um, yeah. Like every little thing, is, I mean, the detail is just amazing. I mean, every little thing's been thought about. Um, all the, it's it's like the yeah. handcrafted leather, brass, metal, it's incredible. Tell me a little bit about about your, your armor. 
Well, I have them here uh, with me uh, at the moment, so I'll just show the for the people who are uh, watching this. This is one of the bracers. It's made by Enric Pujol. From uh, he's from Spain, but he worked from uh, from Germany. And just everything. I don't know. It's visibly good, but even the the, the leather straps. There are uh, small markings of damaging and whatever. You know, the detail is so awesome. The etching in the plates and everything. Yeah. To me, it's all it's all in the details. You know, it's the same like. No, I cannot. Um, like a bag here. This is one of the bags I made myself. I mean, with the, you know, everything what's all here, even the bell. They have small details, a beard comb, for example, or just a small knife. I mean, in the in the total of the picture. This is not this is not really visible. So then you can ask yourself, like, why would you even do that if it's not really that visible? But it's not about what's visible or not. It's about the whole picture coming together. And for me, it's like if you work in all these small details and you see the total picture, it's much more there's more depth in the picture than if I were just use a normal belt without any additions. I mean, the knife I just show you, I don't Remember, I have any picture where the whole knife is even visible, but just even if it's a piece of rope where the knife is attached to or a small piece of the hilt, it just adds so much depth. And it's, you know, again, if we go back to the acting about my modeling, then I envision, you know, what would I take if I'm going to war? I have some money. I have a bag with some supplies. I have a knife, a utility knife. I got a beard comb. I got the armor itself, some more belts, was chainmail, whatever. But the whole package this gives so much depth to the photo, and for me it's so important because I want to provide quality. And if you want to provide quality, you have to go into the details. It's all in the details. I mean, I can take off all the costumes and still be a great model with great expressions, great mimic, you know. But the costumes add so much detail. And of course, if you look like uh, look at regular models, they're not <laughs> getting paid to um, bring their own costumes. But as a historical model, uh, you cannot rely on other people to buy costumes for you. And if they even would do that, then I have no, um, I, I, I have no control over the quality. So I rather make my own, order my own, customize my own or whatever to make sure I bring the highest level of quality available or possible. Um, and I also like to make my own stuff. Why you could ask? Because you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of creativity because you have to build stuff from scratch, from just leather and and brass and whatever. But you're making something unique. I can use some blueprints or just look up some pictures to get, get kind of a general ID. But to really give it your own twist, it's the same like the the interpretation I talked about earlier. Just adding this little bit of your own flavor. Because even 1,200 years ago or whatever, people would still have their own tastes and their own uh, style uh, styles, you know. So I I tried to bring that to my modeling as well. To you know, I wouldn't wear a bag what I don't like, even if it's historical uh, historically accurate. I would change it to fit my style and my preferences and still look cool. And to be able to wear such cool costumes and to add your personalization to it, I think that really adds to the the, the whole package. And of course, that's exactly what it would have been like, you know, a thousand years ago. There was there were no like mass manufactured pieces of clothing. Everything was handmade. Every single piece would have been different, you know, to an extent. So it makes perfect sense to really individualize all these pieces. And you know, much like I, I tell you, what I loved about the whole that whole side of things is, you know, in a photograph, we often talk about layers. You know, creating um, different layers: foregrounds, midgrounds, you know, backgrounds. You know, creating you know layers with props and all the rest of it, and just by looking at your at your costume, it's really I find it really hard calling it a costume because it's like so much more than just just a costume. You know, it's not like I mean, it's, it looks so authentic. You know, from the tunic to um, you know all the different bits of layering. You know, the uh, yeah. the armor bits, the uh, you know the cape, all the accessories, the bags, the weaponry. You know, and and I know. Um, you know, you also use shields, for example, and swords and all the rest of it. Um, the boots, I mean, every 
every little thing, you know, you had different pieces of of cloth, for instance, that you sort of woven into 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 pieces of the um, of the armor, and it was just so rich in in layered detail that you know it was really easy for the camera to you know it was really easy on the camera. That's what I mean. It's, it's just it created a really incredible images, um, and I know you know we did a few. Um, you know, very close up type of portraits. For instance, we did sort of a Star Wars version of, you know, the, the Viking Sith type of thing. And um and that's that's really an image that's very much steeped in darkness because that's what that's the whole point in the you know, it's supposed to kind of portray the dark side of of the Sith. Um but even yeah. in there, you can see these slithers of the costume and it's so rich in detail. The the chains and there's like, you know, leather straps and all the rest of it, and it's just you know, and engravings like etchings and borders. You know, the tunic in itself is is so detailed because it's it's a tunic, but it also it has these elaborate, um, you know, what do you call it, uh, the I Nordic know. kind of um, edgings on it. Yeah. Well, it's actually a great example what you just said about the the, the Sith Lord uh, portrait photo. What we did. It's a great example of uh, how my costume was built. Um, there are so many small details, which, you know, if you would just take a regular picture, it looks great. But the dark uh, vibe of the whole photo and just the minimal lighting bouncing back from the, 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 the etched bronze and the small uh, markings on the leather, it just bounces back into the camera. And sometimes less is more, as, as they say. And, you know, seeing the whole costume, great. But just looking at the picture, seeing all these small little details popping up, even better. I mean, that's just a great example of how the the details in that costume really come to life. Yeah, and it's they really worked really well. I mean, they, they, the way they reacted to the light was just phenomenal. You know, you've got you've got everything from dark leather um, to the cape itself. The cape was like a really dark color with some you know a little bit of patterns on it, um, and that really kind of almost like absorbed the light. Um, but then that really created that contrast, you know, between that and all of these other little things. It was like, I remember there's like almost like a silver chain that goes across, you know, your chest piece. Yeah. And then there's the, uh, the the bronze edgings. Exactly. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, then there's the weaponry. In, in this particular image, of course, it's a lightsaber, clearly, because that's what it had to be. Because, you know. Yeah. Who am I not to create a Star Wars related picture? Clearly, that's part of the brief. <laughs> <laughs> wherever I go, but um, yeah. but you know, I mean, it could have been like you could have imagined that like, it could have been um, a Viking sword, for example. You know, I mean, it could have been it could have been Excalibur for you know, it could have been anything. Um, so it was just a, you know, it, it in in a although it's a relatively simple portrait, it's it's just because it's so layered, it just draws you in and it really makes you feel like. There's always something new to look at. That's certainly that's the feeling I get when I look at that portrait. It's I always look at some at something else. I'm thinking, oh, I hadn't seen that. I didn't notice that thing, or you know, that little pattern on there and stuff. It's uh, it it makes for in, in many ways. It really, in many ways, it actually simplifies the the photographer's work just to have you know, to have some to work with somebody who pays that much attention uh, to the costume. It just makes it makes life. From my perspective, it makes, it makes life so much easier. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, that's actually my approach as well. I mean, I, if, if, if I'm shooting with somebody, then I'm, I'm expecting something from you. I mean, I'm expecting you to, to put the lights there where they should be, to edit. Uh, you know, if I got a big pimple here, I expect you to remove it. Uh, you know, all these things. That's your job. But it's... I think people think too easy of it if they would just imagine like, ah, I'm standing there and I'm looking like how they tell me to look. No, I, I'm bringing my best game. I'm bringing my best costumes, bringing my best uh, best playing. You know, everything, sh like you, you say it perfectly, layering. That's, that's I think that's the, the whole concept of, of how I dress up, you know, adding small layers, adding more details. And I love it. When you when you look at a picture and you discover something new every time, just like you said before, and I think that that you know if I'm expecting something from you, then you should also be able to expect something from me. And you know if I'm expecting one hundred percent, that I'm giving one hundred percent. I should make sure my costumes are on point, that everything is correct, that everything looks great, that my hair is good, my beard is good, 
all the layers are, are good, the makeup, everything, and that pretty much, you know, guarantees for good photos, you know. Um, you should, you know, in the basic, if you make the click and you have the basic unedited, it should already be good. Then you just should just brush it up. If you need to spend hours and hours and hours changing everything, for me, in my opinion, I, I have not done a very good job. I want you to almost get lazy, you know, just seeing the picture like, ah, I could just brush it up a bit, add something here, you know, correct this a little bit. But the the the, the basic, the, the 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 clean slate as I provided, you know, that should be good. There shouldn't be uh, um, too much uh, hindrance of things that shouldn't be there, things that are not correct. Um, my costume should be, you know, in order to make everything should be as it should be, and bringing my best game, and then you should have the, the easiest job possible. And I mean, that really did prove true because uh, that was my experience exactly when, you know, when I came back um, to England and I, you know, I put, I put all these images through post-production. Um, I have to say, I didn't really spend a lot of time editing up these images, um, you know, not at all. I mean, they were probably done with inside of an hour, you know, I think the longest thing right. on that particular shot, we're talking about the Sith um, Star Wars shot, the longest thing was actually creating the lightsaber. There's a whole range of different methods that you can use to create lightsabers, um, and I will at some point I will be um, putting a video together and just you know just demonstrating how I did it in this particular case. Um, that's definitely coming at some point. Um, or you know, if anybody anybody listening to this, or again, if you're watching on YouTube, um, if you want me to do um, a more elaborate tutorial on how to make um, Star Wars lightsabers, then let me know. But there's actually there are a lot of uh, videos on YouTube already that come in really really handy. There's different ways you could do it. Easier versions, more elaborate versions. Um, you know, Boris effects is a great thing. Uh, one thing I, I did uh, add on this particular lightsaber was actually just a dust layer because once I created the, and this is a tiny little detail that is easy to miss when you're when you're not looking, you know, in great detail. But um, uh, where the blade is, you've got this glow that's basically a very much a layered glow over it's like eight or nine layers or 10 layers or something. But then I also put a little bit of dust over it because it just it just makes it look like it's more in the atmosphere, you know. So it's this kind of thing that you would expect when you when you see a lightsaber. I don't know what I would expect if I saw a lightsaber because I've actually never seen a lightsaber in real life. So it's you know it's all down to interpretation. And actually, that's um that's also something I love about um about what you do because you mentioned in the beginning um the sort of the correlation between you know, historical accuracy. And then there's also, of course, the fantasy world, you know, the world of video games and the world of like comics and, you know, fantasy uh, yeah. fantasy games, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and movies, of course. And uh, you mentioned uh, Lord of the Rings. The last, the only other time, I would say, <laughs> the only other time I remember seeing that much detail in a costume was when I went to the Lord of the Rings exhibition at the Science Museum in London which was uh, probably, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. But basically, um, they brought over um, a, an exhibition um, show, showing all the, um, the the costumes and props and models from the movie or from the movies. And uh, that was really incredible because some, you know, they had some of the hero costumes there and it was just incredible to see how much detail um, they, they put into that. You know, detail that you would never see on camera, by the way. Like it went to that granular level, sure. you know, where they would make stuff. Yeah. And even like, um, you know, some of the costumes for some of the background, like, you know, some of the, some of the extras in the background, you think like, why did they go through all of that effort to put that amount of detail in there when you'd never see that? You'd never see that detail. If there's an extra standing 10 meters behind the lead actor and there's some action going on, you'd never see all of the little tiny little engravings on, on their armor. You'd never see that. But they still did it, and it just overall it just adds something to, um, to the reality of it, you know. And it's, well, I thought that's super I, fascinating. I think, I think that if you, of course, you don't see the detail in itself, but I think that if you would see the scene of the movie where they wouldn't do all the details in the costume, then it will just be a lot more plain, and I don't think that it will come off the same as it does right now. Actually, pretty funny that you mentioned Lord of the Rings because I don't know if you've seen any of the Rohan or maybe Theoden's costume, but I mean that Tolkien um, was an amazing guy. He wrote amazing books, 
and he actually based all uh, uh, Rohan uh, people and army on uh, the combination of Vikings and, and, and people on horses. Ooh, that's my area of expertise, of course, and the things yeah. that I like. So I really love the, the Rohan people. And if I look at their costumes, I get a lot of inspiration out of it as well. And exactly as you just told me, that the amount of detail is just insane. And I think that, you know, even if you don't see the exact lining or the stitch or the whatever it is that the detail is, you still, in the overall image, you will see the difference between not having it and having it. I'll tell you one thing that actually floored me at that particular um, exhibition, I remember. Do you remember at the very beginning, of, uh, sorry, no, at the very end of the first movie, uh, Fellowship of the Rings, there's a scene uh-huh. where Sean Bean's character dies and they said, uh, what's, his, what's his character's name? Is it Boromir? I think. Boromir. Yeah. And Boromir. they basically they send him off in this in this boat and they, they push out this boat onto the river and then I think, I can't remember, do they shoot like a burning arrow into it or something like that uh, but they basically they push out they push his his body is in the in the boat and they push it on the river that wasn't Sean Bean in that boat that was basically a Madame Tussauds style wax figure that was in that boat and it was so because they had they had the actual boat with the figure in it and the detail on that was so insane that you had to get this close to realize that that's not a human being in that in that boat what? it was like every little beard hair everything was absolutely perfect it was just it was insane um so you know it was just i remember just looking at the stick he's like why not just put sean bean into that damn boat <laughs> you know, what's so difficult well, about that we have, we have to ask uh, peter jackson about that because i also yeah. have no idea why you did but yeah the, the 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 level of detail and i also you know uh just to, to come back to the detail it's something you can control. I mean, there are so many things in life we cannot control. And I mean, you can have talent to look a certain way. You can have, you know, your, your DNA or your body or your face. It's not something you can ease. You can change your body, of course, but not your face. But details in your costume, something you can control. And, you know, everything what's in your control, you should at least try to bring the best you can. And as I said before, you know, the the, the, the details and everything and the, the general look of the costume and the feel of the costume is something you can control. And I like to invest in, in those things. And, and I mean, we're talking about Lord of the Rings. It's just, now, nowadays, the first uh, movies that came out, they're already, they're from 2002, I guess, or maybe even older. They're 20 years ago and longer. And we're, we're still talking about the details from the costumes. And I mean, apparently they are, that important so yeah they're just like holding they're do... still holding up yeah exactly so that's, you know, that's what thing, i tried to and just just in comparison actually funny thing i just remembered i, I also um, i saw a different the star wars exhibition um some yeah. time ago uh, where they had different stormtrooper helmets and this, this was like from the the original trilogy so they had like a set of different stormtrooper helmets and then they had um, they had them sort of lined up and you could see the hero helmets which would be you know the actors that you would see right in front of the camera and all you know the helmets had like lots of detail and you know they looked like you you know you'd remember a stormtrooper helmet look um but then they had some of the helmets uh from that the extras were wearing in the background and they had zero detail on it it was literally just a white bucket with like you know black eyes painted on it was terrible <laughs> you know and you just go okay obviously they were a lot cheaper to make so they just put these buckets on the people in the background Inc- incredible but you know um, i remember uh, one day we decided that we needed an axe for a particular shoot and we didn't have a viking axe and so uh you and dave went out to uh, like a hardware store you bought an axe and then <laughs> and then you went on to um to basically modify that blood. axe yeah it's like <laughs> fake blood <laughs> it's a little rest of it yeah, well, the, uh, we actually didn't bought one at the hardware so- store because they were sold out. So we went back to Dave's oh. house and he found uh, an axe laying around there, just a small hand oh. axe. Okay. And we had to improvise. <laughs> so we just uh, darkened it up a bit with mud and sand and whatever. And then we just used some fake blood on it. Because again, I mean, you can, you can hold a regular axe and in Photoshop you can add layers and make it a bit darker, maybe some fake blood. But that's still adding it in Photoshop. And I mean, we got great AI tools, we got great, you know, things we can do in Photoshop. 
but I don't want to I, I I don't want to bring the extra work when it's not necessary. I mean, let's just get the basics right, and if then you want to add something, then you know that's your choice. But why wouldn't we just spend ten minutes on on darkening it and spend you know ten minutes more on making some fake blood on it? You just give it that you feel, and I mean. With AI, you can do amazing stuff, but still the look, the feel, the texture, the details, what you get with real blood, real mud, real sand, there's nothing about, uh, nothing better than the real thing. And I guess it also helps you um, as a model uh, to, to put yourself into that role, I guess, when you're holding something that actually looks like the real deal, rather than, rather than you know, holding like a modern hand axe and then just having to pretend that it's a Viking axe. Yeah, everything what I don't have to pretend adds to the to the to the photo, of course. I mean, feeling the the, the texture of the of the, the the grainy sand between your fingers, that immediately just you know everything feels real, and if it feels real, it probably looks real as well. And yeah, that's in my opinion so much better than having to add everything yep. later. And of course, it's possible you can make amazing pictures with you know basically nothing or not much by just adding everything, but. You know, not only uh, if it if it is it possible to add it yes or no, but if if it's in my hands, if it feels real, if I'm doing things with it with what Vikings would do, then it's so much easier to be that thing in, instead of acting it, playing it, pretending it. You are that what you try to uh, portray. You know, and I think that um, you know. I mean, I, I, I've met some artists who are really good with Photoshop and they did just made the most insane things. They, they even changed my tattooages. They did some war paint on my face. It looks amazing, but they're, you know, changing the picture so much that, you know, even though the picture is not bad, if I look at it, it could have been anyone. Um, you know, it's changed so much and that kind of, you know, takes uh, takes away the whole passion and, and the... Uh, how to say that, you know, it just generally makes me happy if I have an ID and it just comes together on the photo. And it's just so much more realistic and, and fun to do it in the real life than just adding it later in my book. Now, another thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, this again is something that um, really, you know, uh, just added to the authenticity of, um, of, you know, of what you do. Um, yeah. And therefore greatly added to the authenticity of what we could achieve photographically is that you know when you have you know when you think of vikings just generally um, or warriors let's say you know medieval warriors yeah. vikings all that kind of stuff of course you're you're imagining a certain physicality um and i know that, that you spent a lot of time working out and you know shaping your body how much work goes into into that into staying physically fit and making sure that you that you uh, are able to create the physique necessary for for that very specific type of modeling. Hello. <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> you know, that, it's another thing that you can control. I mean, you cannot change the face. You cannot, you know, but you can change your costume, of course, and also with the body. I mean, I can I can buy the most expensive costumes in the world. I can take some modeling classes, you know, to to perfect my mimic and everything. But still, if you're trying to portray like this barbarian or this warrior going in the front lines, being the first to attack, you can be some kind of chubby guy, you know, with the rolls of fat hanging out, <laughs> out, out outside of his chain mail. That's, that's just not doing it for the photo. So I try to stay in, sh in shape all year round. And, you know, the thing is, if people call me now and they say like, ah, I got to shoot in two weeks and you have to be this and that and, and we do it here and there, I have to be in shape. I have to be in shape on a moment's notice. So I'm training year round, five to six times per week, an hour a day. I'm ha having to watch my sleep, my food, my, my training program. There is so much work involved. It's not like, ah, I'm just hitting the gym two, three times a week and the rest is, well, everything what I do revolves around this, what we're talking about. I mean, every calorie what goes into my mouth, it's counted for. Um, I have plans for, for my workout. I'm, I'm doing a schedule now. It's 24 weeks. I'm planning, you know, in the future. And all, all weeks of these 24 weeks, I should be able to be at least in top shape within two, three weeks notice, at least. And yeah, people kind of underestimate that aspect as well. If, if you want to portray 
this brutal warrior, you know, you have to be in shape, you know. Uh, you, maybe I'm not this bodybuilder big, but at least it has to come off realistic. And again, it's something you can control. And everything which you can control, you should control. If you want to be a good model, if you want to bring your best game, then the things you can control, you should do your very best to bring bring the best there. So do you, is it predominantly weight training or do you combine uh, cardiovascular training with weight training? How do you, what's your, what does your, um, your workout regime look like? I hate cardio. I, I really hate cardio. <laughs> so I, I try to compensate for the cardio, uh, missing the cardio with, with food so I don't gain too much weight, but basically strength training. Um, I've done a lot of powerlifting in the past. That was really kind of my sport, but as I don't do any competitions anymore, I try to combine a bit of powerlifting with bodybuilding style training so I have the strength and I have the the, the looks of the strength as well um, cardiovascular training is not really something I'm fond of but I you know when it's necessary it's necessary but as I do a lot of physical work at the farm as well I don't think it's really necessary for me personally but I know that a lot of other models they have to do it because you have to maintain a certain weight or maybe not weight but body fat percentage you know to come off as some genuine, you know, warrior-like. And I mean, not everybody is the same, and maybe not everybody feels like they should. But, you know, again, for me personally, I want to bring the best I, I have to offer. And, you know, the things I can't control, I will control. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I know it's I know how much work you put into that. Um, it's really, it was really fascinating because you, you were even training whilst we were out there. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, I forgot to bring my rubber bands. But uh, Paul Cobra, one of the photographers uh, with us at the shoot, brought his. So I borrowed them, and I did some push-ups and stuff like this, uh, just to get the general workout in and the movements done. Uh, and I think it's really important to just, you know, you're in a certain flow, and you have to keep the flow going to to be in shape. You know, if you just stop training for a week or two weeks, then it's really hard to come back up to your previous point and again as I said maybe now I have nothing to do for the upcoming two months but somebody could call me right now and say like hey we got a big project coming up are you available in two weeks and if it's you know shirtless or at least with arms bare or whatever I want them to be able to see on the photo that I resemble at least the picture of a warrior or or as I said a viking warrior barbarian or whatever I mean even if you don't see the actual muscles if I would wear a tunic, just a regular tunic, nothing more, you still have to see the shape of at least a muscular guy or at least somebody, you know, who does a lot of physical labor or fighting or, or rowing in a Viking boat or whatever. You should be able to see that this is, you know, a seasoned warrior, not only in the details of your clothing, but the body as well. And again, it just, you know, it adds to the authenticity, as we, you know, we keep saying, um, because life a thousand years ago would have been a lot more physical than it is today and and food wouldn't have been in abundance as much as it is today so you put these two things together you know you you probably end up with you know a much more kind of streamlined physique um i also like the fact that we we found a gym um in Svalbard, i think so next time we do a workshop there <laughs> we could have to sign up to that gym man because i need it too fucking hell yeah. <laughs> pardon my french i'm gonna cut that little fucking hell out but never mind <laughs> whatever <laughs> We'll hit the gym together. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. That's uh, yeah. I told you. I mean, that's that's um, you know, that's my um, my little thing that that I'm gonna start doing uh, within actually within the next two or three weeks. Um, I'm gonna get back in the gym. I used to be an avid gym goer before the pandemic, so I used to hit the gym about five times a week uh, before that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a big guy. I'm I've always been a skinny guy, and now I'm, I guess, skinny fat is what you could call it. But <laughs> um, you know, but. It's it really is the pandemic uh, that actually completely derailed my, you know, my mm-hmm. sort of enthusiasm for the, for the gym. But I've, you know, I've decided to to hit that um, hard this year, or, or yeah, within the next few weeks or something. That's, that's what's going to happen. So I'll be hitting you up for some training advice. That's for sure. One hundred percent. We'll do it. We'll do a camera shake sub channel that like deals only <laughs> with physical fitness. That'll be fun. <laughs> Now, okay, <laughs> lastly, I want to talk to you about something that I found like super, uh, super interesting also. Um, yeah. Because like I said, you know, I, I knew your work before we before we met in um, in Norway. And 
Um, of course, a lot of the stuff that you do in, uh, involves a whole lot of of other Viking actors and uh, you know and, and Viking models. And it seems to me there's that's like a real little community um, that's happening. Um, tell me a little bit a little bit about the sort of sense of community in that particular niche of modeling. Um, well, of course, you got the cosplay community in general, which is in Holland pretty big. We got loads of big uh, f- festivals and, and the markets and, and whatever. Uh, and also a lot of these people uh, are my clients because I also organize photo shoots, team photo shoots for models and photographers, like a, a shooting event. I will be present there as a model. I can provide horses, for example, but also the clothing for model models who've never modeled before and just want you know the experience of a day as a model in, in, in medieval clothing or whatever, but also for photographers who want to expand their portfolio or whatever, they can just, you know, come to an event and they have loads of cool stuff to shoot uh, for a reasonable price. But, you know, as you go along in time, you know, you meet some people, some people stick around, they like what you do, they come more often. And also I got loads of events, what I'm doing, for example, the Elfia event, which is one of the biggest uh, fantasy cosplay, uh, no, the biggest fantasy cosplay event in the world which I am officially king of. Um, and I did a great show uh, just before we went to Norway, actually. Um, and there were lots of people who voluntarily uh, helped me there, making a great show, uh, including sword fighting and stuff like this. And I also know quite a bit of actors from Holland who also did some Viking or warrior or medieval uh, um, shoots or movies or whatever. And just, just this group of people, what we, yeah, we do great projects and of course, um, it's pretty selective, or, or how do I how do I say this? It's a pretty small group uh, of people who are you know able to portray, portray these uh, medieval characters. You know, not everybody has a beard, not everybody has long hair, not everybody is even willing to go on camera or invest in costumes or whatever. And I'm lucky enough that I can make it my profession. But there are also a lot of people who just do that as a hobby, and you know. You really have to be passionate about what you're doing if you're willing to invest thousands of euros in costumes and working out and doing your makeup and whatever just to have some cool photos. But luckily, there are a lot of guys who really enjoy it and, and it's, it's nice to make friends, like-minded people uh, and also working together. I mean, because uh, as we talk with animals, uh, the, the, the costumes, the working out, that gives a lot of depth and details, but it's also cool to collaborate with other Viking models or uh, with other uh, animal owners, for example. We have great contact with somebody who who has a lot of uh, ravens, owls, whatever. That really adds, you know, more depth, more flavor to the pictures, you know, and and also we did the great show where we had about 60 60 Vikings with us. Um, Yeah, that's just amazing. And also for the for the photographs, if you just have an all army standing as as landscape or or scenery behind you, you can do amazing things with that as well. Yeah, that's the thing that I found um, either really, really fascinating is because I've seen images uh, of you at at events like that. And just to see, you know, the the sheer number of Vikings (laughs) in the photographs quite, you know. Um, tell me a little bit about those um, events. You mentioned an event uh, that you're you're officially the crowned king, so you're literally the warrior king. Um, tell me a little yep. bit about that event specifically. Um, well, to be honest, the, 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 I didn't even know <laughs> I, this, I didn't even know that you could be king um, until I o- wanted to order some tickets for the event, and then there was an election going on, and if you were crowned king, you could have free entrance for ten years. So I was persuaded Boy. very quickly. <laughs> so I uh, just applied to be uh, elected as a king. And uh, then some months later, I got a message on Instagram with somebody congratulating me. Um, yeah, you're the new king. And I was like, oh, king? What? I didn't even realize I was elected. So then I was elected and I asked the people like, okay, so now I'm king. And what exactly is it that we're going to do now? And they told me, you need to go on stage receive the crown and then you got a one minute speech and that's it so i was like okay but why is that it why can't we do more and then i talked with the organization and i was like if i'm going to be king i want to drive there ride there on a horse and i want my army with me so they were totally feeling that idea so i got uh approval to take some 20 guys and and a horse 
we did a small parade and I did a, a, a nice speech with, with promising I keep the land safe and everything. And then I kind of get the idea to make some cool show on the, because they have it two times per year, the, the festival, um, that on the second uh, time around that I would do a real show and, and the crown would be in danger and whatever. So I kind of um, uh, went brainstorming with the, with the owner of Elfia about a story and a script, and then we um, checked my resources, what's possible, if we can get enough actors, enough Viking models, and we did. And then we actually made a storyline like, it's, it's a two-day festival. Like on the first day, I would do my parade, I would do some talking, say that everything would be all right. And then my son would get kidnapped, my actual son got kidnapped on stage by my uh, counter player. And then yeah. the second day, I would fight for not only the crown of Elfia, but also my son and everything. Uh, and we did. We did a great... Uh, it's it's almost like theater because you're doing it live. You cannot do uh, no extra shots or uh, no do-overs. You have to do it in one take, no mistakes. Um, so basically just kind of a mix between theater and sword, sword play. And it was just amazing. I mean, the feeling you, you get riding a horse with... with 50, 50 people fully dressed as a Viking bes beside you playing that they will protect you with their dear lives and then just making a shield wall and, and just telling the people to 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 attack and whatever. It's amazing. And and again, if we talk about playing, acting and being, you know, that it felt so good to just do that. And, and the people were loving it as well. You know, the applause I, I got after the whole show and the, the reactions of the people it was just amazing. The, the video is, is, is dropping, I think, this week or maybe the start of next week with the whole fight and everything. Um, so that's, uh, I, I would invite the people listening and watching now to, to at least check it out to see what we, we've done. But it's, it's just, it's an amazing feeling. It's great to do because then you, it's not only, you know, standing in front of a, of a photo or doing a video, it's live in front of an audience. And that just gives another dimension because you feel the vibe of the audience. I mean, if you're doing a sword fight and somebody hits you in the knee and you're falling down or somebody kicks you over, you hear the audience go, ooh, ooh, ah, get up, get up, go, oh, go, go. Oh. I mean, the, the whole vibe <laughs> of that is so cool. It's There's nothing like it. And where, where can people see that? Is it uh, a festival that happens every year? It's two times per year in Holland, uh, and every time it's two days. Um, the, you can visit the site at elfia.com. Uh, I will give you a link after the podcast so you can put it in your description as well uh, to watch the my YouTube where it would be Great. visible um, for people who are interested. Fantastic. Uh, Ro, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, and I'm just going to just gonna uh, repeat that again. We've got um, the last workshop um, of this season coming up on January the 25th to February the 1st. Um, if you're interested, you want to go over to idavewilliams.com forward slash training. And again, you'll find um, all the links and everything in the description. Um, and uh, yeah, check it out. And remember, there's a super special offer of uh, there's a 5%. You can get 5% off. Um, the code is again in the description. And also, due to our super awesome friends over at Adobe, um, you get a, a full year's um, subscription to Adobe's Creative Cloud all rolled into the whole thing. So what a fantastic thing. Um, that being said, Ro, we've come to the end of today's uh, episode. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm very sure this won't be um, the last time. I know we're planning um, a little uh, Facebook stroke Instagram stroke YouTube live type of a thing um, in the in the very near future, probably over the next week or so. Um, so you know, for those of you, if you're still listening, um, check that out. Uh, you can see that, like I said, on Facebook, you know, just join the Facebook group um, or you know, hit us up on uh, Instagram um, at Camera Shake Podcast, uh, or you can just check out the YouTube channel, of course, if you haven't done that. And if you are there, make sure you hit like and subscribe. Um, but Ru, thank you so much for being a guest on today's shows, uh, and we'll see you soon. Okay, folks, that's all for today. It was fantastic to have Ru on the show. I'm sure... Uh, many of you found it helpful. But before we go, let me just recommend another episode that I think you'll like. Check out episode 173, where we discuss the Lofoten experience in more detail. I'm sure you'll love it. If you enjoy our content, consider supporting us on buymeacoffee.com 
uh, forward slash camera shake to help uh, you continue to, to help us continue creating and bringing you more exciting episodes. It really does mean the world to us. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fledged video version on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest photography in full Technicolor? All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. That being said, we've come to the end of today's episode, um, and we'll see you again on Thursday. Bye.